Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Hill, and I'm a biologist at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center, calling in from my home office. Prior to introducing our guest speaker, I would like to acknowledge that the National Conservation Training Center is located on the ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples. Due to the painful history of forceful removal, we could not find a full account of the indigenous peoples who occupied this land that was taken from them. We are aware that many indigenous peoples traversed, cherished, and lived on this land. They include, but are not limited to, the Massawomack, the Iroquois, the Shawnee, and the Delaware. As we learn more about the indigenous peoples, who had and continue to have relationships with this land, we better appreciate the good earth on which we work, live, and learn. We are committed to building and sustaining relationships by highlighting indigenous communities, offering indigenous-based webinars, and sponsoring programs and activities for indigenous youth. We encourage others to learn a more about the land on which they work and reside. At any time during the presentation, should you have questions, please enter them into the chat or you can email them to broadcast at fws.gov. If we don't get to your questions today, we will do our best to follow up with you after the broadcast. Today, we are going to hear from Frank Wan about his music career and the influence nature has had on his career. I apologize for the technology glitch that we're experiencing. We should be hearing from Frank very shortly. Please stay tuned. Um, we look forward to your participation in this event. One, two, testing, one, two. Can you all hear and see me? Okay, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I think um, the the technical difficulty interrupted uh, Jen's introduction of me, so uh, I'm gonna get started here. Mitaku yapi oyate tchacha o mani macha pelo naha yuha chante washte anape chuza pelo. Hello, everyone. I just introduced myself in my language Lakota, and I said I welcome you all with an open heart and an open handshake. I'm gonna start off with uh song that I wrote on the flute for you all. And I'll tell you about where I come from because it inspired this song. <laughs> That song is called Home, and my home is the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. So I was born and raised on a reservation located in South Central South Dakota, and it's one of the larger reservations in the United States, one of the top seven largest. It's actually the size of our smallest state, so it's about the size of Rhode Island, and it's, um, you know, 
uh, very rural as well. Uh, there's one stoplight on our whole reservation. And, you know, we, um, we got like one Subway restaurant and we didn't get that till I was out of high school. So it's, a, it's very much a, a rural, isolated community. But what I'm going to be doing with you all today is I'm going to get to do something fun. I'm going to um, I'm going to get to share the ways in which our natural world influences my work as a Lakota artist. I'm a musician, audio engineer, music producer, songwriter, um, public speaker as well. But, you know, in, in all sorts of ways, my work is influenced by my cultural teachings which are rooted and grounded in our natural world and living in balance with our natural world. You know, uh, um, if you get to the root and the core of, you know, almost any indigenous culture, it's about um, being a good relative and living in balance with everything, including our natural world. So, you know, when I, when I think of nature, I think of m almost everything in creation. You know, I have like an indigenous perspective of it. And, I, I play several instruments, including flute. I play flute. I play bass. I'm going to be sharing a song I wrote on the bass with you all later. Um, I play piano was the first instrument I started on. started teaching myself to play piano when I was seven years old. I've always been drawn to music. You know, and sharing songs has, al has always been a sacred act for, for Native people. And we've always used music to communicate with each other and to communicate with our ancestors as well, to communicate with spirits, to communicate with the creator. We've always used song and dance to do that. It's It's been an integral part of our cultures. And so I see what I'm doing as just a continuation of that songwriting tradition. And this next song I'm gonna do for you all is a song that I wrote a few years ago for someone who saved my life. This song is called Wopila, which is the Lakota word for thank you. And I wrote this song for a medicine man, a, a, a spiritual leader from my community who passed on in 2019. And he played a big role in my life because, um, you know, my community and a lot of native communities suffer from very high rates of, you know, depression, um, mental health issues, suicidal ideation, suicide rates amongst youth in the United States are actually highest amongst native youth. We are 10 times more likely than the national average to commit suicide. And if you get into the history, uh, the whys of that is rooted in, you know, um, us surviving a genocide and a lot of issues that come with, you know, being survivors of a genocide and all, all of the things that, that uh, you know, currently make it hard for us to live happy, healthy lives in, in the United States. And so, you know, I, I struggled with uh, my own mental health issues for most of my life. And that's actually why I started um, playing music and writing songs was to help myself cope with all of what I was dealing with, you know. And music became almost a very much a tool for healing for me. At first it was an escape and then it became a tool for healing to create almost a sort of medicine for myself, you know, audio medicine, medicine and songs. And I know everyone listening, you're probably here because you like music and you probably have um, your own experiences or examples in your life of how music has been medicine for you. So this song is definitely one of those songs that is like medicine for me. And this song is also an example of the way my, my, my songwriting is in, influenced by our natural world. So something I do as a songwriter, as a flutist, a flautist, is I, I would listen to bird calls and bird songs for inspiration. And, you know, I'll be, whether I was at home on the reservation or I'm, I'm coming to you live right now from Chicago, I've, I've lived in Chicago. I live on the South side. I've lived here for a little over a decade now. I went to school out here and stayed out here after I graduated. Whether I'm in Chicago or at home on the reservation, I'm always listening, um, you know, for inspiration from our natural world as I'm at, when I'm out and about. And often I'll hear a bird call that I like. And I actually used to live next to a bird preserve on the South side of Chicago. 
And so I have tons of recordings on my phone of bird calls. And I would kind of like, you know, put, put what bird it was if I knew the bird. And this song is inspired by actually eagle calls, which I don't know if you ever heard eagle cries. But they're very like high pitched and sharp, almost like stab sounds. And uh, I did that because this medicine man, you know, in, in our culture and Lakota culture, medicine people. Um, have their gifts are passed down through DNA. It's not something you choose to do. It's something that you were born with and then you you pick it up and, you know, um, learn ways to share that gift with the world. Not too different from what I'm doing as an artist, you know. And uh, this song is, is uh, inspired by Eagle Calls because this particular medicine man, one of his spirit helpers was the Eagle Nation, the Wambli Oyate. And that's another thing that we believe in our culture is Different medicine people are tied to different elements of nature, different animals, um, even storms. You know, I'm going to get into that a little later. Um, even insects, you know, so um, very much not only in our medicine people, but all throughout our culture, people have connections to these natural elements. You know, it's very much, I believe, in our DNA. And um, this song, uh like I said, was written as a thank you, drawing on eagle calls. And I'm going to play this song. And when I'm done, I'm going to talk about um, a cool experience I had uh, with an archaeologist from the Crow Reservation about how I write flute music. So again, this song is written for someone who saved my life. And it's a thank you song. Um, and this is something that we also do in our cultures. We have you know, a lot of songs to give thanks. And that's something that I do as a songwriter. So this is a song, you know, for all of us who who've lost loved ones, especially during the pandemic. You know, it's been it's been a heavy time in every community. And I myself have lost a handful of loved ones and mentors to the pandemic. And so this song is also for them for thanks that we got to share the time that we had with them in a celebration of their life. This is what we love. And you're going to hear an echo, you know, like a delay. Or, um, it's not a glitch in the Zoom. It's an effect that I have for when I play the flute. So that song was called Wopila. And like I said, you know, it was inspired by, by eagle cries. I told you why I chose to use eagle cries. And that's an example of um, what I mean when I say, you know, as an indigenous artist, I'm inspired by my natural world, not even just in the things I talk about, but, you know, in the creative process as well is rooted in my connection to our natural world through my culture. And, you know, I see here in the, um, we got some comments, Sharon Blair's coming to us from Pierre, which is the capital of my home state of South Dakota. Um, she's working from the Lower Brule Sioux, Sioux tribe. Um, 
So shout out to Sharon. Uh, that's a sister tribe to my tribe. So within the plains, there are actually seven bands of Lakota tribes. And it's pretty cool how this is structured. So um, the Great Plains was occupied by groups of, na of indigenous nations known as the Ocheti Shakoi, the seven council fires. So there were seven bands. And within that was one of the bands was Lakota. And within the band of Lakota, there were seven bands of Lakota. And so the number four and the number seven are important in our culture and, and, and influence us in a lot of what we do, including that. I come from the Sichangu Lakota, which is um, the burnt thigh nation is the translation. You know, the story is uh, my people had to run through a plains fire to survive, so we burnt our thighs. But, um, you know, uh, as a songwriter, like I said, all the things that I learned from my culture influence how I how I um, produce, write, and record my music. And that song you just heard is on a flute album I have called Aloha Wetu, which is Lakota for spring songs. And I, I recorded this and released this album during the pandemic right when it hit in 2020, spring of 2020. And I actually recorded all these songs outdoors in places and spaces that are important to me. And then I share the stories of uh, why I wrote those songs very much so, similar to what's happening here. So if you like what you hear, you can find all my music online. And even, you know, I even recorded one of my albums outdoors because as a native artist, I'm also very conscious of place and space and how that influences, you know, um, how we perceive music. And so this next song I'm going to do for you all is a really cool representation of something I do as a native music producer and songwriter. It's actually a cover song and it's a cover of a Fleetwood Mac song. So my mom raised me on a lot of really great music. She had great taste in music and one of her favorite bands is Fleetwood Mac. And now I, I, I'm, um, you know, I'm an adult and I also love Fleetwood Mac and now for different reasons, you know, now I understand why my mom liked all those songs and there's a Fleetwood Mac song that um, one of my favorite songs, but it also reminds me of people in my family. So these next two songs I'm going to do for you all are, are very much inspired by my mother and my relationship with my mother. And I want to also know, you know, if you have questions or comments, you could drop them in the chat. And at the end, we will get to the questions that you have. So even if they're coming, you know, now you can drop the question in there so we can see it later on. But this song, this cover song I'm going to do, again, is influenced by by um, a lot of what, I, what I'm taught from my culture. So I said the numbers four and seven are important to, to my people. And those numbers um, influence my work a lot. And I'll give you an example. So when I set out to do this cover, I, I said I'm only going to use four instruments to create all the music because I'm also a musician and a music producer. So I used um, a Lakota drum that I got as a Christmas present from my mom. It's made out of buffalo hide. When I was in fifth grade, I got this drum. So it's an old drum. And then I used bass, I play bass. And then I used the gourd rattle that I got, I'll grab it right here, as a gift. I got this as a gift from a, a singer from the Southwest, Tono Odom track. So I did a performance down there, I travel and perform for a living. And you're gonna hear this instrument in there as well. So, that and the fourth and final instrument is flute because, you know, unfortunately I can't sing like Stevie Nicks, but my flute can. And so I, as a bass player, I would, you know, um, learn a lot of my favorite songs on the bass just to jam. And I, I learned Dreams by Fleetwood Mac and I would just play it, you know, to myself. And I realized that I could sing the melody with my flute. And so I, I, I created the song I'm about to do for you all, but I completely reimagined the song too. So that's another thing that I like to do as a native music producer is if I do a cover song, I, I want to completely reimagine it. So it's almost unrecognizable, you know, but but um, you still know where it's coming from. I love when artists would do that and it would give you a a different, you know, in, interpretation of the song or, or a different perspective, you know, and I think that's what. The more I learn about my culture, it, it, it is just that. It's almost like taking what we already know or taking what we already have and reinterpreting it or looking at it a different way to get something else or something different or something more out of it. 
So with this song, I slowed it up a lot. So I slowed it up so I could put a little more filling into it. And it kind of sounds, you know, almost ominous, a little creepy. Um, and another reason for that is um, Native people, I believe, you know, are gifted dreamers, especially our artists. And I myself come from a family of dreamers. You know, I, I have a story that will give you an example of what I'm talking about. So my... My great grandmother, my grandma's grandma, um, and her family, they had a nickname for her. They called her the witch because she would, she would receive things and she would know things about people and she could almost kind of even predict the future. She would, but they would come to her in dreams. She would see things that would happen. And it became, you know, so prominent that the family accepted it and had like a nickname for her, the witch. So, I come from a very large family. My mom has eight sisters and three brothers. And we all grew up in the same house. I have lots of cousins like my brothers and sisters. And when my mom was younger, her oldest brother, it was his senior senior prom, senior year. And the day before prom, um, my great grandmother, my grandma's grandma calls, calls her and she says, I had a dream that your, your son, Jim, is going to get in a car accident. So, you know, I just want you to keep him home for the next few days. And so, um, you know, my grandma told, told her grandma that his problem's coming up and she'll, you know, she'll do that. And you can imagine my uncle was not happy that his mom made him stay home. Um, uh, he didn't get to go out. He went to prom, but he had to come home right after she went and got him. So he was not happy about that. He didn't get to, you know, go out and spend his prom night with his friends and, and his date. But that night, his friends got in a car accident and a few of them passed. You know, so um, I, 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 I grew up hearing stories like that about my great grandma. And then, you know, nothing that powerful, but I myself have had, you know, a handful of dreams that showed me something that came true. And sometimes when you're shown that, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's, uh, it's ominous, it's creepy, but it, and it's powerful, but it's real. Like you can imagine if, you know, you're having a dream about your relative dying in a car accident, but these dreams are gifts as well. And I believe that our dreams are um, one of the ways that our ancestors and the natural world speaks to us. And so this is my interpretation of that. This is my cover of Fleetwood Mac's dreams. I say this is dreams in the key of Lakota. So I'm going to play a backing track that I produced. And, and play the flute.
one thing I want to highlight about that song, and I don't get to talk about this a lot, but this is the space for it, that is when I produced it, I imagined it coming. The song is like a storm, you know, and again, you talk about being influenced by the natural world. So if you notice, you know, it kind of started off like lightly and it built up, built up, built up until like the end, the chorus, when the rattle came in. And to me, the rattle is like the rain, you know, it's like the thunder strikes and then it's just all out storm. And then the storm passes and, you know, it kind of ends how it began. And one thing that um, I wanted to mention earlier, I, you know, I talked about an experience I had with uh, a crow archaeologist. So as a flute, as a flutist, like I said, I, I'm inspired by bird calls. And another thing that I'm doing as as an artist is I am working with the Field Museum in Chicago. So the Field Museum in Chicago next month, May 2022, is debuting a new Native American exhibition hall. And it's this huge multi-million dollar project they've undertaken years ago. It's the longest project I've ever worked on, but um, it's going to be really awesome. And they're working with a lot of Native people. Um, they're completely reimagining their Native exhibition hall from the ground up which is great because the way it was done was very old and just very disrespectful, you know? And so they, they, they realized that and they undertook this project within the new native American exhibition hall. There are five almost like rooms that will feature rotating exhibits that will be there for two to three years. And in these exhibits, it's um, stories of native people um, working with items and collections. And I got to got the opportunity to co-curate one of these um, these rooms to be a music music interactive space where, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm sharing with you about, you know, um, the cultural influence that goes into these songs. I break down in that exhibition at the field, um, you know, and I use uh, four flute songs, including um, the first song that I did for you, Wopila. And each of those songs kind of is a different example of how I am influenced by our natural world. And then after that, in the middle of my space that I curated, I worked with a design team to create uh, 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 a recreation of my home studio. Cause I've been, I've been, um, I'm a music producer. I've been recording in my home studio since I was a teenager, you know, building it up throughout my life. And I worked with a design team to create basically an app where you can make a beat with me using my instruments, all the instruments you're going to see me play today. Um, I, I created little loops, you know, like little repeating loops and you can choose loops and kind of mess with them and alter them to create a unique beat, including some vocals from me. And then you can email that to yourself. So not only do you go through, you know, my space and you gain, you get knowledge, you learn about some history, you learn about my journey as a native artist, but you also get to create something and, and take it home. You get to email yourself. And so during that time, um, I was at the field museum and they had this uh, archaeologist from the Crow Reservation. He was a native guy, Crow guy. He was there doing some research because the field museum has the largest collection of Plains war shields in the world. Because if you think about it, Chicago was the first stop off from the plains. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that would be collected in the plains as far as native items and artifacts, they would bring to Chicago and, and sell. And a lot of times the field museum would get like first picks, you know? And so I was talking with this archeologist and without even telling him, you know, about my own process, he, he started talk, um, you know, I started telling him how I'm there working with the flutes and uh, he, talked about how pre-colonization, the way our ancestors played flutes was different from um, the way that they play flutes now. Um, he said pre he said right now the way we play we play flute is very influenced by Western music, of course. It's very melodic, you know, so I just played some two very melodic songs for you. And he said before that, before you know we, we picked up that tradition, um, pre-colonization, we would actually mimic bird calls. And that was how we came up with our flute songs. And I told him that I was, I was doing that exact same thing, you know, and 
no one had taught me that. It was just something that I, I, I learned as a native artist and picked up as a native artist. And so, you know, that's an example of how I'm influenced by our natural world and um, how that, that, you know, influence has also guided my, my path as an artist, um, as a native artist. And so this next song I'm gonna do for you all is gonna be on another instrument. So again, I play flute. I also play bass and I have a beautiful acoustic bass here that I love to play. And something that's interesting about how I play, you know, I've had guitarists tell me that I play bass like it's a guitar. So I also have a unique way of playing music, of playing guitars, and, you know, of coming up with songs on the bass. So let me see here, I'm going to back it up a bit so you can see me. And this next song I'm going to do for you all is a song that is influenced by our creation story. But before I get into that, this song is actually a song that I wrote as a birthday present for my mother. So I wrote this song for her in 2011. At the time I was going to college, so I have a Bachelor of Arts in Audio Arts and Acoustics. So I went to school to learn how to do what I'm doing as far as the studio side. And I was on scholarship. You know, I was, I was, I was on scholarship. I was um, struggling artist. I wasn't getting, you know, paid to, for my music yet. I was still, still just starting out. And I was also coming from one of the poorest counties in the whole country. My reservation actually sits in like one of the top five poorest counties in the whole country my whole life. We're always in the top five, it seems. And oh, that comes with a lot of issues, you know, a lot of struggles. And I was raised by a single mom. My mom and dad split up when I was three. My dad's also from our tribe, but he's not a very good guy. And he bailed on us, and he was a violent guy, you know. And they split up when I was three, and then me and my mom moved in with my mom's family. Like I said, she has a big family. So she has all her sisters, all her brothers. And I was around all my cousins, you know. Um, they actually own and operate a ranch on our reservation. And at the time, they also did uh, rodeo stock. So, you know, I grew up on a ranch that was ran by Lakota women, which was pretty unique. It's a matriarchal environment because it was like me and my mom and my aunties and all my cousins. And unfortunately, a lot of my cousins had deadbeat dads as well. And uh, I kind of joke and say we were like the no dad tribe. And so our moms were raising us, our grandma. And, you know, the older I got, the more I looked back and just realized how awesome that was that, that I'm able to, was able to get a scholarship, study what I love and travel the world doing what I love for, you know, communities that mean something to me. It's very important. And it wouldn't be without my mom's sacrifice. You know, I was like one of the first people in my, my family to get a degree when I was number number two and you know my grandpa my mom's dad the man who raised her only had an eighth grade education he dropped out of school in eighth grade and lied about his age to join the military so he could provide for his family and you know I think about that I was thinking about that because you know I have a lot I have several gigs this month but in February, I performed at Stanford University for Stanford Live. And at the beginning, at the end of March, the beginning of this month, I performed at Harvard University. You know, so to go from my grandpa had an eighth grade education to I never, I, he never would have imagined in his life that his grandson would be performing his music at Ivy League universities, you know. 
but it wouldn't have happened without the sacrifices he made and the sacrifices my mother made. And so, you know, I wanted to say thank you to her. And so I did it with this song. But I want to share the creation story that this song is inspired by. So the song is called Like a Rock. In this creation story, we'll talk about my culture's connection to the land and the earth. So our creation story says that before all of creation, before everything we know, there was only one being. And that being was was eon rock or stone and eon was alive eon had life and blood just living and breathing I put my bass down so i can use my hands and eon gave some of its life and its blood to create the earth and the sky and then it gave more of its life and blood to create stars and water and when that happened, Earth said to Rock, I am cold. Can you give me something to protect me and keep me warm? And Rock said to Earth, if I give the last of my life and the last of my blood to create beings that will protect you, Earth, you must return that relationship. It must be reciprocal. Because Rock said, if I do this, I will sacrifice myself and I will die. And so Earth agreed. And Rock gave the last of its life and the last of its blood and created all of creation, animals, humans, plants came to be. And when that happened, Rock shriveled up and hardened and died and shattered and fell to Earth. That's all the rocks and stones we see on Earth today. And... That's also why Lakota people, the sweat lodge is one of our sacred ceremonies, you know, with those hot rocks. And so that story led to my idea for this song because our Lakota word for, for rock is eon. Our Lakota word for woman comes from our word for rock, it's weon. I'm going to turn on this fan real quick so I can get some And so, you know, within that creation story, I'm gonna turn on my fan, I'm sorry, I need some, need some air circulating in here. It's getting, getting a little, little emotional. But, um, you know, uh, our Lakota word for, for woman is weon, which comes from our word for rock. And so I was thinking about all that, you know, how we were a matriarchal society and our word for woman comes from the, our word for stone, which created earth and all of creation. And that's why I call this song Like a Rock. This is for the woman who raised me and sacrificed so I could be here, like I said. So this is for all of our mothers, our grandmothers, our big sisters. And this is my final song for y'all, and then we're going to go into the Q&A after this. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I see some already, and we will definitely get to those. This is like a rock. Eighty-nine, we said hello, he said goodbye, daddy left when I was three and made us cry, you and I, we had to make it, you found a way, drama came and friends left, but mama stayed through everything, all the fights and all the shame, all the change, I hate that man, don't want his name, told my mom that I'm a one, couldn't understand all the things going on between her and my dad, but I was stubborn, I know that it made things hard, you always said Son, I know you're gonna take things far Believe that, I need that In dark times, I think of what you did for me And my heart shines You took my hand up this mountain Made it your climb So when I shine, mom, you shine Yeah You found a way One day I'll bring it all back Lives all my life Just me and you Every single storm that you see me through 
Cause I ain't have a dad and we ain't need no man Raised by a woman, you made me a man I gotta leave home cause my heart will roam I gotta let you know that you're not alone I love is like a rock and you will be my stone Forever in my heart, forever in my heart You always gave me what I needed, somehow always found the time Single parent, it's a parent that you stayed up on your grind I remember you would put me first It was hard, but you said, son, it could be worse And you were right, it's funny, looking back, the days were sunny You kept me smiling, even though we didn't have the money That other people did, somehow you made it happen I promise mama that I'm gonna do it when I'm rapping Cause you took me everywhere in my cap and my backpack 20 years later, now I'm rapping the snapbacks I'm rocking these long braids, we came a long way You kept me on the right road, away from the wrong way Forever I'm grateful for the life you gave The tears that we cried, the sacrifice you made Yeah, a single mother with the odds stacked You found a way, one day I'll bring it all back Lived all my life, just me and you of every single storm that you see me through Cause I ain't have a dad and we ain't need no man Raised by a woman, you made me a man I gotta leave home cause my heart will roam I gotta let you know that you're not alone I love is like a rock and you will be my stone Forever in my heart, forever in my heart, you're my stone so Thank you Like I said, that song's called Like a Rock aka my stone and that is for my mother the woman who created me so now we're going to roll into the q a portion of this i'm going to open up a window as well if we have any questions <laughs> i want to say thank you to everyone I'm, I'm going to open up a window real quick go for it Thank you. Yeah. So I see some here. Yeah, thank you very much. Your your passion, your enthusiasm are infiltrating. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank you for that. And we are going to go into a question and answer session now. I see a few questions in the chat. Please feel free to enter more in and we'll try to address those as we have the time for. Um, I have to start off with the first thing, which is the last thing. Well, you mentioned it throughout your presentation, but you really focused mm -hmm. on it on your last uh, musical performance there, which is the influence your mom has had in your life. And I wonder if you could speak towards any influence nature had on your mother. If you know <laughs> yeah, that. definitely. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, what? I never thought about sharing that because, like I said, you know, I this is such a cool, unique space for me to talk about that side of what I do. But the funny thing, you asked that because um, she, she, man, she loves the land. If it's possible, I mean, I love the land, but she loves it and, and works with it even more than I do. So. She grew up on a ranch, but right now she actually um, surveys for our tribe's his historic land preservation office. So, you know, if there's going to be like construction sites or whatever, she's one of the tribal monitors that's sent out to make sure they don't disturb any cultural sites and just to make sure they're culturally compliant. And she's she's been doing that on and off since I've been in high school. And so she's worked with, uh, before that she worked in a school. So she's worked with youth and she's worked with land, which is funny because that's like, you know, the path I've taken. So um, definitely growing up on the ranch, you know, she's all, she was always teaching me the importance of taking care of the land you're on, the space you're in, even our, even the, the place our house is, you know, like we didn't have much growing up, but she really took care of what we had. And, and, you know, that even went into the land we occupied. My, my family, like I said, has a ranch and, um, you know, the way they do it is it's not a large ranch at all. I feel like it's very much, um, done in, in, in a way where we don't exploit the land and the way that they use the land, you know, um, was very um, thought out so that, you know, the land isn't, isn't, isn't abused and how they graze their cattle and, and all that. But her work with the historic land preservation office, um, 
uh, is is something that's very near and dear to her, her heart because you know she she knows a lot about our culture. She cares about you know um, cares about taking care of the land and being able to you know be a facilitator to make sure that no cultural sites are disturbed. Um, whenever you know any sort of construction is being done, is something that I know is is very important to her. So yeah, my, my mom my mom is right now she's on she's on a job right now. So she's currently out working with and protecting and taking care of the land right now. Oh, that's so sweet. That's just, I love how your mom has been such a great influence on your life um, and that you speak to her in many ways, including your, your artistic ways. I think that's very special. Um, the, the next question is, you spoke a lot about music as a medicine at what age do you think you began to notice the impact of being in nature had on your well-being and your musical influence? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. You know, it's like I'm 32 now and about to be 33. And I feel like when I was younger, I, I was I was I was in nature every day because I grew up on a rural reservation. Um, bef we didn't get the Internet until I was like 15. And so there wasn't a lot to do. There was a lot of negative stuff to do. But I really loved sports. Um, I really worked hard in school. And then I would always also like always teaching myself to like play an instrument or something. So if I wasn't if I wasn't in school or you know, making a beat in my bedroom or writing a song. I was outside playing sports. Um, I was also a distance runner. So one of my coping mechanisms was I would run. I used to run, you know, wake up in the morning, 6 a.m., run eight miles and then run eight miles as the sun was setting. I loved being with the land, especially, you know, distance running. And I knew at the time I, I knew that, like, even though I was a child and you don't really understand fully because our brains aren't fully developed. I knew that just being out there helps me work through all, all 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 of what i was dealing with in my mind you know but now looking back you know living in a city and not being able to do that even physically or being able to be out with the land like i used to i realized how integral that was to my balance um just my whole well-being my mental health my physical health my spiritual health you know um i i was i i had a, a really good balance being able to be outside as, as much as i was when i was a kid um you know not just with my own stuff but helping my family out on the ranch you know i look back at all that now and when i was a kid you know sometimes you take stuff for granted i was like oh maybe sometimes i didn't want to be helping the family work and i wanted to be doing something else but now i i i i crave that you know and i take that every opportunity I get because I, I realize just how important being connected to the land is to not just natives but human beings like it's a very human thing it's in our DNA all across any culture all across the world you know even not just native people any people if you go back there, there's there's native na there's tribes there's nations there that that had a connection to the land and I think so much of you know uh, what we do as human beings um, it, it is about place and space. And there's so many things that I think disconnect us from the land now and, you know, kind of like don't have us thinking about that connection. But I truly 100% believe that being connected to land, even like physically putting your bare feet on the earth, you know, um, all that is goes down to our DNA and it helps us be, be whole, it helps us be well, and it helps us live in balance, you know. Yeah, I totally... I totally feel you on that. I, from European descent, I feel the same way. Um, there's just something about the earth, Mother Earth, that is totally healing and just can't be without her. Yes, um, it's in our, I, like I said, I believe it's in our human DNA. So we all got that. Yeah. So some of the questions that have come in um, folks are wondering if you could elaborate, um, actually let's go with this one. Can you tell us about anything about the an artistry of your flute? Did, did you or someone you know make the flute? Yes, that's a great question. I've seen those questions and, um, both of, uh, so I, I spoke a bit about 
you know, some of the, the creative influences I have uh, with this instrument. So um, I also learned a lot, you know, whenever I was uh, curating the exhibit at the Field Museum because I got to work in collections. I, I also just did a lot of studying about, you know, even, even traditionally and ancestrally um, what this instrument meant to us. But what's really cool about this instrument, and I mean, it's pretty universal, is the way that these flutes are being made is pretty exact, exactly similar to the way they were made hundreds of years ago, you know, the way my ancestors made it. It's a very tried and true design. It's a very tried and true instrument. And like I said, um, it's universal. I've seen flutes on every continent, wooden flutes, bamboo flutes. And so again, it's, I think this is a very human instrument. It's, it's a human thing. A lot of, a lot of native things get down to just being a human and the, uh, this flute, um, some of the, you know, technical stuff, this flute is made of walnut. So this one was made of walnut. The other one I played is made of cedar. That's why uh, they're a little darker, but you know, I, I chose those instruments, um, or chose that wood because, uh, uh, there's there's sorts of the, there are those sorts of trees where I'm from and cedar also is culturally significant to me, but uh, um, I did not make these flutes. I ordered these flutes online from a place called the uh, High Spirits. Um, I am in the process of uh, commissioning someone back home to make a, a custom flute for me. But you know it's a uh, um, it's interesting because then you get into tuning as well and if I'm going to be playing with Western music and Western instruments, uh, it needs to be tuned to a Western scale. And so that's like a whole other ballpark when you're talking about you know creating acoustic instruments. And so um, one thing I know about how this flute was made traditionally is that there were a couple ways. There were kind of two ways of going about it. They would take, you could, you could see this is one piece. They would take one piece of wood and they would uh, take like a hot iron and they would push it through to create, to go through about to right there. And then they would come on this side and they do the same thing, but they wouldn't go all the way through. So if you go, there's like, there's like a bridge right there and that's how you get the melodic you know the the sound of the melody the flute the 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 sound that we know as the instrument comes from that bridge so they would do that and then you know burn the holes that was one way of doing it another way that it was done is they would merge two pieces together and they would do it with glue so they would take the neck bones of buffalo and they would boil it and the fat and like grease that would coagulate at the top, they would take a stick and wrap it up and it created a very strong adhesive, a glue basically. And they would use that glue to, they, they would take two, you know, they would take two pieces, they would kind of whittle them out and then they would glue them together. And they said that that, that buffalo net glue was so strong that once it would harden, it would be like one piece of wood, like it wasn't two pieces. And what was cool about that glue is, you know, it would, it was only active when they'd heat it. So it would be like, they, they'd, uh, they'd wrap it around the stick and they'd, they'd use it. And then when they wouldn't use it, they'd take it away from the heat. It would harden. You could put it in your, your pack. It wouldn't get stuck anywhere. You know, it was, it was a, it was a, a, a traditional glue that my people used. So I know that that, um, you know, and this one is made with the one piece method and, uh, you know, to back to the beginning of the question about some of my artistry. So I shared with you all, how I'm inspired by bird calls, but I'll give you an example. The 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 first song I played, Wopila. So another thing I do with my artistry is I sometimes um, use this instrument to 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 strengthen uh, my 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 journey of learning my language. So I'm not fluent in Lakota. My great grandmother took it to the grave, and. With that song, I actually really focused on the phrase Wopila, so thank you. So if I were to say it as, as, as a male, I'd say Wopila yellow. So following an eagle call, I almost sing Wopila yellow up and down the flute. So I'll, I'll do it one time. It's like, Wopila yellow. So that's one. And I do that seven times because again, fours and sevens are very important in my culture. They root my creativity. Seven because Lakota people acknowledge seven directions, west, north, east, south, up into the, the sky and the stars, down into the earth, and then within yourself, that seven directions. So I do that, like kind of seeing that phrase, wopi la yalo, thank you, seven times up and down the flute. That's one, two, 
three. So if you pay attention, I do that several times. So that's just, a, 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 um, you know, to answer your question of some of my artistry with the flute. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. That actually answered a couple of other questions that we had in the queue. Um, and I see several like kudos in the chat about your, about thanks for sharing your story. Um, I think we have one more time or time for one more question. And okay. I would ask as a native artist, what do you feel is the most important message you can convey to your audience? Mm, that's a great question. That's a powerful question. As a native artist, the most important message I can convey to my audience. I think, you know, in a word, it 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 touches on what I what I was saying a bit earlier about, you know, some of these things that um these, these, these things that, that I know about being Lakota, like Lakota people believe in this. I think one of the main messages I try to get to is showing people that, that, that looking at the world from an indigenous perspective benefits everybody because it's such a human perspective, you know? And like I said, um, even if you go back to Europe, Europe had indigenous nations, Europe had tribes, you know, so that indigeneity is in all of us and that it gets to, to the very core of who we are, which is being a human, you know, being a body, a spirit and a mind. And how do we find balance all of that with, within all of that within the universe? And, you know, we are connected to the earth. We are connected to the, the sky, the stars. And so, you know, I, um, I'll, I'll leave you with this one story that I think is a perfect example of what I mean that you know, looking at indigenous worldviews is looking at the past, but also looking at our future. So I learned that within our language is um, code for the universe. And an example of, of that is our word for star. So our Lakota word for star is Wichakpi. And if you break down this word, it's two words put together. And it's an example of some code to the universe. And it touches on what we were talking about you know, which is being out in nature is so integral to our well-being as humans is, um, you know, we're made from the same the same elements, the same particles that are in nature. But our word for star, we chakpi is two words together. The first part is we cha, which is short for we chasha, which is the Lakota word for man. And the second part is uh, our word for flesh, chekpi. So literally our word for star was man's flesh because we were star people and we understood that our bodies were made from the same particles as stars. And I remember in 2019, NASA released this big article and I seen this, this, or this big study and I seen this article come across my social media. NASA discovers that human bodies are made from the same particles as stars. So in 2019, NASA just found out what, you know, uh, my people knew in the beginning that, uh, you know, uh, we come from the same particles of stars we come from the same particles as the earth so being connected to all of that is just a part of being human mm, that's beautiful thank you for sharing that i'm realizing yes. that we are out of time and that we also haven't highlighted how the native youth congress has impacted your life so i think we'll save mm. that for another call Yes, that's a whole other thing. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear more about that. But I do want to be respectful of people's time. Um, and so I, I really want to thank you for sharing your story with us today. It means a lot to hear your voice and your words. Um, as, as a Frank Juan fanatic, I have to admit that I have your My Stone song as my morning alarm. And I wow, encourage so others awesome. to do the same. It's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful song. Um, but I just, I wanna reiterate that we appreciate your time. And for those of you that have joined us today, I encourage you to please plan to join us for our next Indigenous Connections broadcast titled Perspectives of a Tribal Liaison. We'll hear from Melissa Castiano and Crystal Leonetti on Wednesday, May 18th at 3 p.m. 
And just as a reminder, each broadcast is recorded and available on NCTC's website. If you wish to learn more about future broadcasts or to be added to the listserv for broadcasts, please just email me. Uh, it's Jennifer underscore Hill, H-I-L-L, at FWS.gov. And I want to thank each of you for joining us today. It means a lot to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Jen, and everyone who organized. I appreciate being here. Hopefully, I'll be back. Yes, you will. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Okay.